I'm going to try and summarize a 300 page book in 15 minutes. So bear with me as I do that. Uh, and I will uh, expect that there will be some questions at the end. Uh, and I will encourage you to and tease you to read the book more than try to really capture the, uh, the entirety of it here today. So my book is a close reading of a single law that was passed in 1929 uh, in India, uh, the Child Marriage Restraint Act of 1929. Uh, but what it tries to do is also raise questions about um, identity, uh, about the law, about gender justice, and about the writing of history itself and uh, that remain important in the present. Uh, so just for instance, uh, this month, Somalia's parliament is considering a new sexual intercourse related crimes bill, which will allow child marriages once a girl's sexual organs mature uh, to bring the law, law in line with the tenets of Islam, they claim. The change is being condemned uh, because it is seen as eroding the gains made by civil society over the last several decades. Meanwhile, uh, a Hindu fundamentalist government in India is also considering uh, raising the age of marriages again. So they're going in the opposite direction and they are considering raising the age from 18, where it presently stands, to 21. My book, Sex, Law and the Politics of Age, considers how similar moves were made and debated in India in the early 20th century and urges the reader to pause before thinking of uh, the first move as necessarily regressive or the latter as necessarily progressive. It also asks us to reconsider how the choice of particular minimum ages of marriage so easily becomes a way of signaling as well as disguising particular political positions. Uh, Lauren, could you put on the presentation now, please? I can do, yeah, bear with me two seconds. Yeah, uh, I'll continue. The CMRA or the Child Marriage Restraint Act of 1929 is very well known to historians of India as well as legal scholars because it, it was it remained in the statute books till 2006. Uh, it was the first law uh, passed in India that set a minimum age of marriage with an eye to restricting child marriages amongst all communities in colonial India. It also defined the child with chronological precision, uh, the next slide please, as um, a, a person, if male, a person who if male is under 18 years of age and if a female is under 14 years of age. While historians have tended to ask questions such as why these particular ages, was this a compromise, why was this age not particularly low, um, all of these questions presume that something called age always already exists and works everywhere as a measure of legal capacity. Through a close reading of the Child Marriage Restraint Act in its particular historical context, I show how the legal norms and moral codes that rely on chronological age and that are taken for granted in India and around the world were created at the nexus of colonial history bureaucratic procedures, cultures of timekeeping, and a narrowly juridical understanding of the human. So my book tries to relocate the history of child marriages in India in this broader intellectual terrain by asking, what makes a child legible to us as a child? Is age a suitable criterion for measuring consent, capacity, responsibility? In other words, it uses the archives of the Child Marriage Restraint Act to show how the logic of law, which presumes that age is a natural measure of human capacity, makes possible, but also limits our understandings of gender justice and human rights. So the book proceeds in three parts. Lauren, could you please uh, change the slide? Uh, provincializing childhood traces the ways in which the affective and scholarly category of childhood relate, relies on a child-adult distinction that is embedded in and crucial to liberal political theory and traces how the distinction was made ubiquitous through colonial law and then subsequently through international law. In the first uh, chapter, for instance, I explore a well-known case from 1889 where a child wife was raped to death the case of Pulmoni Dasi, um, 
that was widely cited to raise the age of consent to from 10 to 12 years in India in uh, 1891. I show how doctors dwelt upon signs on her body, the presence of hair, the shape of breasts, the size of bones, the type of clothing, not only to find uh, signs of injury, but to settle upon the signs of what made a body legible as that of a child. Hmm. In chapter two, uh, returning to the definition of the child provided by the Child Marriage Restraint Act of 1929, uh, a child is a person who, if female, is under uh, under 14, if male, under 18. I ask whether our comprehension of the child is, in fact, entirely bound up by the letter of the law. Considering the relationship between what I call the autoptic child, the child that is was made visible by the medical gaze or the autopsy, and the juridical child or the child made legible to us by the terms of the law itself, the first two chapters seek to provincialize childhood by showcasing how our idea of the child is rooted in the history of liberal political theory, forensic technologies, and governmental technologies, and liberal law. The two chapters also trace the history of what I call in my book the epistemic contract on age, or an agreement that age serves as a natural measure of human capacity, and which renders illegitimate other ways of comprehending both the gendered human and her rights. The paradoxical faith in chronological age in upholding rights and justice was perhaps in evidence early on, as my book shows. Lauren, could we have the next slide, please? Imperial critics of the Child Marriage Restraint Act of 1929 boldly posited that the law was failing quite simply because Indians could not be trusted to tell their own age with accuracy. Could we move to the next slide, please? Um, how can an offense under the law be proved unless the age of a victim is known, is how uh, the British humanitarian activist Eleanor Rathbone put the question in her book on child marriage, which you see on the slide there, and that's something that I close read in the book. In, in my book, I ask the same question, but reverse its critical thrust to ask, if it was indeed the case that people could not tell their own age or um, records of age could not be preserved because of the peculiarities of the colonial condition in India, why did age remain so crucial to upholding rights and to securing consent? By the 1920s, the civil and criminal codes were peppered with age stipulations uh, beyond the age of consent regarding the capacity to labor as an adult, make contracts, assume criminal responsibility, or dispose of property. During this time, however, colonial officials remained convinced that in India, age is not a matter of fact as in England, but a very doubtful matter of opinion. In the censuses of 1911, 1921, 1931, as I show in my book, could we have the next slide, please? Census officers repeatedly expressed anxieties about the problems with recording age and standardizing age in India. Uh, so some of the issues, and I discussed these in detail in my um, uh, first two chapters, some people counted from the period of gestation, others considered a child to be aged one when it was born. Uh, the 1911 census report that you see there uh, noted that there was a preference for particular digits of age, where a fourth of the population had preferred to report their ages in uh, ending in zero, so 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. And a fifth had used five, returning their ages as five, 15, 25. So age was basically an approximation rather than uh, some sort of accurate uh, reporting. Uh, and for more such anecdotes, please read chapter two. But to return to Rathbone's question, could age be objectively proved in courtrooms, even in the face of uh, native mendacity? Um, as I show in my book, through a scrutiny of cases involving underage uh, victims, as well as perpetrators of sexual violence, even the medical legal determination of age was 
uh, and it is, is far from being an exact science. Um, so the well-known and much used forensic textbook, Lyons Medical Jurisprudence in India that you see in front of you, um, instructed expert witnesses how to estimate the age of um, either victims or perpetrators through the examination of teeth, height and weight, hair and breast development, degenerative changes, extent of ossification. Uh, so as you see from the, the chart on dentition there with, uh, for the appearance of permanent teeth, while the appearance of um, the milk teeth in infancy are the permanent teeth between ages 6 and 12 provided clues to age in the very young, a rare study by a prison doctor in Bombay, for instance, had confirmed that while canines usually appeared between 10 to 13 years, uh, in India they were known to appear as early as 9 years of age. So um, as late as 1918, there was no information available or that had been collated for average height and weight available for Indians to guide age estimation. And figures from England were simply reproduced in these textbooks with the handy hint that the average height and weight in the majority of Indian races is lower than that of Europeans. So looking at these kinds of textbooks, well, the first part of my book historicizes age with the help of the methods developed by the history of science and the intellectual history of liberal thought. In the second part of the book, I turn more explicitly to queer theory to question the use of age as a measure of consent and of sexual morality. So in chapter three, for instance, Lauren, could you please change the slide? Uh, I close read um, the Child Marriage Restraint Act of 1929 to trace its unacknowledged affinity to a set of provincial bills that were more explicitly um, that were more explicit in their evocation of Hindu ethics and especially the tenets of Brahmacharya to prescribe minimum ages of marriage for males alone, for instance. Um, and I can explain the use of que the queering age stratification a little bit more in the uh, as I do questions. Uh, Lauren, could I have the next slide, please? Chapter four shows how Hindu reformist norms came to be represented as based in ancient India and in modern Western science. For instance, um, the chart that you see at the bottom of the page there, a teaching chart uh, on sex education, was translated as upholding the Hindu understanding of Brahmacharya as a stage of life uh, devoted to studentship and that was to precede marriage. The chart you see to the left, which is happiness in relation to age in marriage, for instance, is, um, is a chart that appeared in the Indian Journal of Sexology. Um, and these sexological charts were likewise represented as um, simply reiterating the ideal age differences in marriage that had always already been uh, part of Hindu wisdom and the ethos and the ethics of Brahmacharya. In the third section of my book, I recall how this representation of Hindu reform as secular and as scientific had as its counterfoil the representation of the Indian Muslim as backward, unhygienic, and addicted to child marriages. Besides showing how the passage of the Child Marriage Restraint Act was closely tied to the political minoritization of Muslims in the 1920s and 1930s, I also propose that the epistemic contract on age undergirds historical scholarship as well as feminist critiques on the descent of, uh, on the history of Muslim de descent to the CMRA. Uh, I propose that the epistemic contract of age only permits us to see this descent in particular ways, and that is what I wish to challenge. So in my reading, I take at face value some of the objections, some of the very diverse objections that were raised by Muslim critics of the Child Marriage Restraint Act at the time. Uh, for instance, uh, one um, critic suggested that Islam simply does not contain prescriptions of a cut and dried 
nature of a uniform type, such as age, age restrictions that were to fit all irrespective of other conditions. And uh, that Islamic law already contained certain safeguards to protect child wives. So in recalling these uh, critiques, my intent is not to argue for the superiority of Islamic law as such, but simply to follow through with a critical exercise that uh, is captured in um, Sabah Mahmood's provocation, which is the sign under which I write the last two chapters. Could I have the next slide, please, Lauren? Uh, Mahmoud writes, while Islam bears the burden of proving its compatibility with liberal ideals, we do not ask what it would mean to take the resources of the Islamic tradition and question many of the liberal political categories and principles for the contradictions and problems they embody. And in my final chapter, uh, taking inspiration in these words, I turn to the principle of the option of puberty contained in Islamic law, to question the liberal political category of age and to also um, interrogate its relationship to consent. In doing so, I'm also able to point to a blindness uh, that I see in some of uh, our best feminist writing on child marriages in India to these Islamic categories of thought in India's legal heritage and India's legal history. To make this point clearer, the book ends once again where it started in the 1890s uh, with a lesser known case of another child wife um, that was a precedent setting case, uh, that of Badal Aurat, a child who was charged with bigamy. And the case had come up before Justice Amir Ali in Calcutta in 1891. Amir Ali, a jurist armed with his extensive research on Islam and law, had set himself the task of using, as he put it, the opportunities for creative interpretation provided by colonial courts to reinterpret liberally, in his words, the Sharia codified by generations of colonial officials and to showcase Islam's ability to modulate its tenets with the changing times. In my reading, I suggest how his judgment in the case of Badal Aurat might be read as providing an illiberal basis for understanding consent, one based on the rejection of the epistemic contract on age. Badal, age unknown at the time of the appeal, had initially been married by her mother at the age of five and had remained during the time her husband was serving as a prison sentence and had rather remarried uh, within the time. Amir Ali sum summarily dismissed the husband's appeal to punish Badal and asserted that there was no proof that a first marriage had been anything more than a formal betrothal. But he took it upon himself to clarify for the future the legality of such child marriages. In Badal's case, he reiterated that a girl given in marriage as a child by any person other than her father or grandfather had the option of repudiating such a marriage upon attaining puberty. Um, I will not go into further details of this case, which is the basis of the final chapter of my book, where I also trace how this case became a precedent that was cited and recited uh, in colonial courtrooms to let other Muslim uh, child wives uh, walk away from their marriages when they appeared in courts. Again, my intent in detailing such cases is not to celebrate such judgments. In fact, I caution that these kinds of uh, capacious interpretations became uh, restricted over time already in the late 1930s. But what I want to do with these cases is to step away from the epistemic contract on age that constrains not just our notions of gender, gender justice, but also our feminist categories of analysis. I ask why else is it that Pulmoni Dasi's case, the case that was cited to raise the age of consent in 1891, is so visible to us, while Badal Aurat barely makes an appearance? Why is our account of the past so haunted by the present? And finally, when we think of the plans afoot now, 
to change laws regulating child marriages, whether in Somalia or in India, perhaps we can draw more complex conclusions and ask whether India's move is progressive at all. And we can allow ourselves to wonder why the regulation of child marriages with reference to an age of puberty instead of to chronological age, in, which is, you know, it has been long dodged um, around the world, is so readily legible to us as an instance of turning back the clock. Um, just as a very particular culture of time, empty, homogeneous, measurable, and standard units is crucial to the recall and record of chronological age. It is that very culture of time that allows us to look back at history and pass judgments of something being progressive or regressive in suggesting that we think of age as, sex as a sexualized and intimate expression of uniform standard time. I hope that the book will also be able to demonstrate the need for some more careful thinking on sexuality uh, when we think about uh, the well-known post-colonial critiques of historicism as well. So I'm going to leave it there and I will turn this over to Aron Dekar for her brilliant comments. Thank you. Should I start, Lauren, or? Yes, please do. Yeah, I've taken the I've taken the screen share off now. So, okay. Hi, I'm Anjali Arundekar, and it's a real pleasure for me to be talking about this beautiful book, which you must buy right away. I'm holding it in my hands. I've had the pleasure of of listening and learning from Ishitha's work for quite some time. So, this book for me culminates, um, you know, many of her intellectual and feminist historiographical interventions that I've been looking forward to for a very long time. So what I'm going to do is, because I've had the pleasure of reading the book a couple of times, um, is just going to talk about the things that I loved about it and, um, and try to raise some questions about the broader amplifications of the questions she raises. And I'm going to start with, um, with something that, that Ishita herself signaled at the very beginning of her, of her summary of the book. So without further ado, I want to begin my brief uh, comments today with a couple of observations from our current pandemic and apocalyptic post-colonial times. Even as Ishita's book wonderfully tracks a specific temporal period of which I will speak more anon, I want to say more about its generative resonances and provocations for legal histories and debates of sexuality in post-colonial India. Let me begin with two historical scenes. A historical scene one, uh, which Ishita signaled as well. In his address on Independence Day, given from the Red Fort in the nation's capital, New Delhi, Narendra Modi, India's peacock-loving, relentlessly celibate, and belligerently ageless prime minister, lavishly declared, and I quote, we have formed a committee to ensure that daughters are no longer suffering from malnutrition and they are married off at the right age. As soon as the report is submitted, appropriate decisions will be taken about the age of marriage of daughters, end quote. Now, in so doing, Modi promised that he would raise the legal age of marriage for girls, which is currently 18 years to 21, as Ishita herself noted, thus bringing it on par with that of men. Since there is no obvious constituency that was petitioning for such a change, Modi's declaration could be seen to be motivated by the belief that simply raising the age of marriage is the best way to ameliorate the health and nutritional status of mothers and their infants. Let's leave aside the prehistory of this declaration, which lies buried in the BJP's constant mantra about the dangerous fertility of Muslim women and the rapacious seductions of Muslim men. One way the BJP has repeatedly noted uh, this point is to enact the logic of the love jihad, as some of you may know, and simply make it harder for Hindu women to be married off. So raising the age is one way ostensibly to do that. 
the national coalition advocating for adolescent concerns which comprises i think of about 21 ngos immediately got worked up and responded to modi's declaration noting that increasing the legal age of marriage for girls will quote only artificially expand the number of married people deemed underage and criminalize them and render underage married girls without legal protection instead transformative justice is required is what they noted the coalition also reiterated that the prohibition of child marriage act passed in 2006 instead of curbing child marriage has only played as a weapon in the hands of parents to punish their daughters for elopement and is used in conjunction with other laws to punish boys in arranged marriages etc so that's scene 1 now historical scene 2 Let's turn to another moment of liberation and celebration. Now remember one of uh, Ishita's point is how do we sort of jostle this paradox of progress and regress, right? Which is sort of in some ways conjoined in the sign of the child. So it's important that Narendra Modi makes this declaration at a moment of celebration within a time when people are losing hope, right? So I'm going to give you hope by raising the age of marriage. The other scene is also a moment of consent which is um a uh, uh, liberation and 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 um celebration that has at its center an odd and complex uh, debate around consent and sexuality as well i'm referring here of course to the supreme court uh, end to the archaic anti sodomy statute section 37 in 377 in 2018 which for the most part has been a cause of much celebration for queers and allies all over not just in india south asia but pretty much everywhere yet despite such certain re- recent reappeals of section 377 and a general opening of sexual freedoms for india's sexual minorities uh we leave aside for example the rather messy uh, problems of the trans community which i'll come back to later uh there still remains some confusion about what the legal age for consent is for sex for homosexuals and heterosexuals in certain situations in other words yes we are free but when we get to consent to have unnatural sex to use an old colonial phrase remains inherently dodgy the consent fixed by the courts currently for homosexuals is 18 two years higher than the age of consent fixed for heterosexuals in certain sexual situations and practices right so even as homosexuality has been decriminalized the courts clearly state that any individual below 18 could not consent to a homosexual sexual act a homosexual sexual act is basically a penile non vaginal act and any person doing so would be open to prosecution Now consider the comical fallout of this old legal decision old and odd because it's a repetition with rupture a girl can consent to have penile vaginal sex at 16 but in order to have oral or anal sex because thankfully it's not just the homos who do that she would have to wait two more years till she is 18 to consent to such acts and since the judgment referred to penile non vaginal sex something as i said not confined to same sex intercourse there are now effectively two legal age limits to cross if one is to legally have sex with a woman on oh, uh, one at 16 which is section 375 and another in 18 going by section 377 now I belabor these two historical scenes as they stand now because age remains as Ishita's wonderful book reminds us um in what we would say in queer parlance as a hot epistemic mess right the minimum age for marriage is 18 for girls and 21 for boys right now there are enough legal anomalies that allow one man the license to rape his 15 year old wife because remember despite the age restrictions on marriage marriage to a 15 year old is not void if it is um uh, undertaken willingly and without coercion those two terms cum grano of course while another can be pos- prosecuted for consensual oral sex with his 17 year old girlfriend at the center of all of these numbers and dizzying legal permutations is the deeply variegated and paradoxical history of the age of a child and adult that is ishita's project 
and its relationship to the promise and failure of a nation's liberatory ambitions. Now, nations in terms of the colonial British nation state, as well as the post-colonial and I would say fascist Indian nation state. Modi, for example, wants to be a champion for women's rights by saving them from the perils and responsibility of entre guillemets, adulthood at 18. The Supreme Court equally wants to safeguard women's bodies from unnatural sex by raising the age of consent for such activities to 18. Even the laws against girl-child labor define a girl-child as someone who is not yet 14, whereas the Juvenile Justice Act sets 18 as the upper limit. Now, I begin with these messy intercalcations of age, gender, sexuality, and national reproductivity because they speak directly, for me, to the intellectual ambitions and horizons of Ishita's wonderful book, Sex, Law, and the Politics of Age. What would an engagement with the histories that Ishita outlines allow us to see or oversee within the age-related anxieties that so confound the legal and temporal imaginaries of post-colonial India. In other words, to riff on Ishita's own words here, how are the heterogeneous temporalities of the nation extended, undone, and revitalized by the repeated normalization of childhood and adulthood as categories of citizenship and subjectivity. Let me say more about what I mean. Sex, law, and the politics of age provides a deft and ambitious, in the best sense of the word, genealogy for the concept of age and its subject effects within the emergence of India's child marriage laws and beyond. Now, I want to focus less here on the impressive histories of evidence that are on display in the book, some of which you've already got a glimpse of from the summary that Ishita provided, but to ask Ishita to speak more in the spirit of a conversation on the variegated epistemic forms and genres, genres of historical evidence at work in this nuanced history. Overall, for me, this book is as much a genealogy of age as an idea and as unfolding crisis of reading for both the colonial and the post-colonial state. So age as a space of catacresis, right? Instead of simply a place that moves back and forth. The larger conceit of this book is to provide a much needed South Asian and one would say more Indian history of the categories of age and consent and their translations and tribulations within legal and social structures of surveillance and control. How could we use Ishita's exemplar of empire's difference in India to think a more foundational interrogation of how age as episteme must be thought anew across a range of geopolitical forms and empires? So this is less about Ishita's book per se, but more about what her book forces us to think more around. And I think to me that has always been the most exciting part of reading a book, right? What what avenues of inquiry it opens up rather than closes down. And I think that's the sign to me of, of this book that's the most exciting. So how can we use Ishita's um, example of empire's difference to think this age is an episteme across geopolitical forms? As Ishita reminds us, the Indian colonial history of the idea of a child and age in general requires us to re-engage the common sense axiom that age, quote, simply is, and that is something we all share. How could we think with this important intervention to engage in more South-South conversations around issues of sexuality and legality and citizenship? For example, I've just finished a book on histories of sexuality in colonial Portuguese India, and I was repeatedly struck when I was doing the archival research the how the Portuguese remained deeply uninterested in the debates around the age of consent that were raging at the same time across the borders in British India. What modalities of age and consent were being mobilized in Portuguese India that we do not recognize if we are looking at it through the historiographical lens of British India? And how would they dovetail with the histories and examples that Ishita alerts us to? 
does age occupy other epistemological and linguistic vernaculars of representation? And how can Ishita's book teach us to think alongside these often divergent histories? Now, one key instance of how age and other categories are at work are always already geo-objects can be seen through Ishita's use of queer concepts and, and vocabularies. So I'm somebody who works on queer history and area studies, and I'm always sort of struggling to suture those two forms through texts, archives, um, intellectual genealogies. And Ishita's book is, is one wonderful example, you know, by which we can attend to creating those sutures, but in often segregated fields, right? So these, so the questions that I'm gonna end with are in that spirit. So what does it mean to mobilize a specific episteme of queerness within the kinds of histories of kinship, gender, and consent that Ishita takes us to. In short, I would like to think more with Ishita on the book's relationship to queer studies, the Euro-American form as episteme politics and vernacular, right? So because of the preponderance of queer citations from the US and, and European Academy, sorry, Canada is not really happening here, um, we need to think more about how queer vernaculars also have their own geopolitical genealogies, right? And, and this is a question that Ishuta and I have been talking about for many years, and I think this book allows us to, to um, amplify those questions in very substantial historical ways. There is discussion in the book around these questions, but it remains compacted as one does when one writes books, and I'd love to hear more, especially as queer studies in South Asia still tends to be overwhelmingly focused on identitarian histories of LGBTQ emergence, something that I think this book is not doing, and I am grateful for it. Lastly, let me end with some observations that are in the spirit of extending the provocations of this book um, and to think of its modes of entry as historical invitations. What does it mean to cast a queer eye on histories of sexuality in India through the genealogy of age? This book deftly engages, for example, one uh, prominent example would be the slippery category of sodomy and its tenuous uh, relationship to age, consent, etc. So my question would be, how would we engage the kind of slipperiness of sodomy that Ishita explores, particularly in legal cases, in genres outside of those forms, right? So extra legal genres that also concatenate this nexus of sexuality and age, um, you know, that Ishita is, is very interested in. For those of us who work in colonial archives, we know that what is history one day is, is law another, and what is literature one day is, um, is sexology another, right? So these sort of um, crossovers are, the conditions of possibility for the work we do. So I wanted to sort of take the lessons of the legal forms that Ishita takes and encourage us, if you work on literary forms, for example, to think about the seepages back and forth. All right, last but not least, the book's critical, critical ambitions also compelled me, this reader, to think beyond the teleological and chronological coupling of time and colonialism and to think about other teleological concepts, and I'm using teleology because there is a moment, a movement in the book from CMRA to onwards, to think about other historical moments such as slavery. I'm talking about histories of slavery in South Asia, Indian Ocean models of slavery, not just Atlantic models, that may trouble and or aid the arguments Ishita is putting forward. If age produces the idea of a reliable subject and the idea of a human, what do early conventions of human making, such as slavery, add to these genealogies of age? The introduction makes a compelling age case for problematizing settled understandings of age as natural, human, gendered, and even race, all within the language of a single law and related forms of codification. Can age also then be seen as an affective and historically ontological fact, right? So if you are not studying the period that Ishita is thinking about, how are the questions that she's asking resonating for us 
across uh, temporal um, categories and, in my case, geopolitical forms, right? Um, I was not thinking about age of consent when I was doing my archive work in Portuguese India because it did not appear to me in the ways I had learned to read it in British colonial India, right? So this applies not just to the same temporal moments across colonial British India and Portuguese India, but also before and after, right? That's why I began with the post-colonial moment and I'm ending with a sort of prehistory of the colonial moment, if you will, right? Last but not least, um, as a literary scholar who lives within historical archives, I wanted to hear more about the hermeneutics of age that found many of the debates in this book and its epistemic reach across a range of bodies and subjects. Knowing, in quotation marks, and reading, in quotation marks, age accurately are a constant evidentiary quagmire in this book. And I wanted to know more about how these slippery genealogies of age connected to a broader crisis of reading around evidence in general, right? So in many ways, um, as I was saying to a colleague of mine, this book for me is also a good example of historical method, right? Which underscores the foundational unreliability of colonial archival materials, right? So age is our object du jour, but it also allows us to see these slippery forms around all kinds of categories that spread across class, caste, gender, and religion, all right? I think I'm almost done. So let me end then uh, by saying that um, Ishita ends the book by making Hindu sexology, for example, a global vernacular, even as its formulations counterintuitively engage and supplement the writings of British sexologists such as Havelock Ellis. So my last question would be, how do genres such as pornography that are often masqueraded or were read as sexology appear within these debates? In many ways, I'm using the historical method of the book itself, which pushes us to think about the kinds of evidence we use to think more capaciously in terms of what constitutes the evidence of sex here. Now, I have a lot more to say, but I realize I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to stop there. All this to say, buy the book, read the book, learn from it, and um, I'll turn it over to Ishita now. Thank you so much, Anjali, for those um, for your careful reading and for um, telling me that I'm far from being done. Um, there is um, there is a lot more to think about uh, in the book, and I think in some ways I was aware as a, in the writing of this book. Uh, that I was not going to come to a satisfying closure, even for myself. Uh, what I am hoping to do when I feel like I have done here from your questions is to um, raise a series of questions about age that are really about um, issues of sexuality, um, about gender justice. But I think very importantly, as you point out, also about the nature of historical writing, historical methods, and historical evidence. Um, I can try to answer some of the more uh, specific questions that you had for me. And maybe I, I, I think I would like to tackle the question that you and I have been thinking about uh, for a while now, uh, which is my use or my uh, desire to think with what I call queer theory, uh, and queer theory that is very much rooted in its sort of North American context, as it appears in my book. Um, and I think I will answer the question um, by sort of reiterating what I was saying before. For me, and, and what you said yourself in your question, what I try to do is Take queer as a way of reading and as a way of thinking, as a as a way of um, getting beyond um, the notions of, I think, time and age. Uh, so one of the things that I do in my book is think about temporality, think about historical time, and think about age as an individuated expression of that. Uh, temporality. And I think that is, that is to me, uh, inspired by queer reading. Mm -hmm. um, as to 
you know, and 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 I, I and I think what was interesting to me is sort of the resonance of that kind of uh, methodology that I can arrive at from uh, by way of queer reading with post-colonial post criticisms of historicism, but a sort of a uh, slippage between the two and a fail and I think a sort of absence of that kind of um, centering of sexuality in sort of post-colonial critiques of historicism and by by which I think I mean say the Chakrabarti's work which I talk about uh, and by no means do I mean you know work done by folks such as yourself and I think that is that is what was driving me, I think, in my efforts to do what you urge us to do in your own work, which is to think about queer theory and area studies and bring them into dialogue with each other. So that's the shorter answer to the question. And But the longer answer is that uh, there is more thinking to be done there as I proceed, because it's not, it's certainly not something that's all, I mean, that it's not a project that's finished for me in the sense that I I think I've completed a book on child marriages in India, and I think I've raised certain questions about age and the law that are going to be sort of taking me forward uh, uh, as I think about um, the next project or two. Uh, Lauren, I'm wondering if if there are any other questions uh, at Hi. all. That to be taking uh, as well. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say first, thank you so much to both of you for a fantastic um, presentation and comments on the book. Um, it was really, really excellent. Uh, so I shall start reading out uh, questions that we have got in for you. Um, so the first one is, can you tell us more about how you are using queer theory to analyze notions of age? Sure. Um, so one of the, so actually if we, if I, okay, let's not go back to the presentation now. Um, so I, I am using queer theory and, and I put up the slide there where I'm citing the work of the scholar Stephen Angelides to think about, um, age as a problem uh, of power and knowledge and not just a, a, a sort of question of, um, of, of consent in the ways that we see it um, when we are thinking um, only through a certain type of feminist framing of the problem of consent. Uh, and I use queer theory and what he calls the queer theory of age stratification. Um, in, in some ways, that thinking is quite foundational to my questioning of age as uh, foundational to sexual morality. Um, and, and I think what I'm able to do with the particular historical context that I'm dealing with is to uh, deflect that question of age and consent into areas that would probably not were the not were not the grounds on which the queer theory of age stratification were generated by. So maybe that's a way of getting to uh, Anjali's question as well. Uh, what does it mean to cast a queer queer eye on the problem of child marriage? Is to uh, is to render uncomfortable, I think, um, ideas associated with the queer theory of uh, age stratification as generated within uh, uh, the North American field in which those ideas are generated, um, as well as serve to uh, make us uncomfortable with some of the certainties of feminist reading of the problem of child marriage as generated from within the field of South Asian feminist historiography. Um, so that, that is how I would answer that question. And thank you for asking it. Thank you. Um, so the next question that I have in is, um, uh, so how do you historicize consent? Has its understanding or definition changed? And if so, what historical methodology can we use to explain that? Um, 
I'd say to really know how I historicize cons consent, you would have to read the 300 pages that I have written. Uh, but uh, a quick and short answer to that question is, um, I historicize consent by putting into relation uh, or putting you know, to the foreground how a particular way of understanding consent um, that permeates at least our understanding of consent when it comes to questions of sexuality uh, in the present is generated within a very specific field of um, it, which I identify as liberal political theory. And what I trace is how um, there is a distinction between child and adult, which is not absolutely tied up with age, but becomes so over time and becomes sort of foundational to thinking about rights and consent and justice within uh, what we can broadly describe as liberal law. And in historicizing it, as i.e. locating it, consent within a very particular historical development and contrasting it with ideas that are no longer legib legible to us as something akin to um, consent in other, le uh, other legal traditions, I am able to um, sort of um, what I, what I call provincialized idea of consent, while at the same time pointing to um, ways in which uh, consent can also be delinked from that particular historical context and translated and understood as in ways that are more capacious and that are not so located in uh, in one particular legal tradition that is not so tied up, therefore, in what I call in my book or describe as the epistemic contract on age. So it is the it is this sort of peculiar uh, tight relationship between age and consent um, that I find is um, it's very hard to shake off is what I am um, doing here uh, in terms of this project of historicizing consent um thank you um that's great um so the next question that i have is going back to the 19th century context do you see a genealogical or other relationship between child marriage and child labor laws is medicalization the key difference or innovation in the 1890s um one of my chapters actually uh, ex explicitly takes up the question. My book is about child marriage, so I will not uh, come up with any kind of false advertising here. But I do use um, child labor as a way in which to um, sharpen my argument about how sexuality um, comes into play when it comes to questions of age. So uh, I, I look at child labor laws um, in the 1890s that were simultaneously uh, under discussion as the Age of Consent Act of 1891. And what I try to do there, um, and this is my first chapter, is to, sh is to sort of locate the sort of common genealogies of, um, of, of sort of the thinking about age that informed those separate debates, but at the same time, try and think about why is it that certain issues such as consent became more, um, more of a point of focus um, when it came to marriage and not when it came to labor, uh, if that makes sense. Um, so okay, so so is so and and what is and in terms of getting to some of the specifics of what of, of the detailing of the the med, the medical gaze and the child, this is this was very much the case uh, with uh, child labor laws as such, in, in the sense that if if we are talking about whether these forensic technologies were being utilized outside of the context of um, sexual consent and marriage. Yes, they were, 
uh, and, and 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 at the same time, uh, it is the sort of obsession I think with um, with Indian sexual morality when it comes to questions of child marriage that sort of led to a heightening uh, of the panic rega regarding these forensic technologies as well. Uh, and uh, the panics about what con constitutes a reliable evidence of age was all the more uh, sort of uh, high pitched when it came to the age of consent debates in the 1890s. Uh, even though there is, there was sort of a parallel discussion about child labor uh, at the same time. Great, thank you. Um, and then I think we have time for a couple more questions. And um, so the next one is, um, in terms of the disparity of ages between men and women, did the fact that young girls were viewed as being inherently more mature in India contrast with how British women were viewed in terms of sexual marriage maturity? Um, so can can so can I repeat? I I will have to repeat the question. So how it does does the way in which Indian women were seen did it contrast with uh, with with British women? So shall I read the question again? Um, so in terms of the disparity of ages between men and women. Did the fact that young girls were viewed as being inherently more mature in India contrast with how British women were viewed in terms of sexual or marriage maturity? Um, so, you, so I think it's a two-part question, which is about the disparity in ages within the law between men and women. No, yes. but the disparity ages between British women and Indian women and how those. So, so what I, I I'll try to answer the question to the, 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 the as far as I can understand it. Um, so there is, a, in the book I mentioned the, the, the British marriage law, which in fact actually follows and does not precede the 1929 um, Child Marriage Act. In, 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 in fact, the, the debates in India, I suggest, is what provoked a minimum age of marriage in, uh, in Britain. And that's just a matter of historical detail that's not developed fully in the book. But uh, it's um, it is it is it is important to recall both that the age of marriage uh, was not higher in Britain while these discussions were taking place. But at the same time, I the the question reminds us of uh, the place of race in all of these uh, discussions of the age of marriage, and there there is certainly. Um, a, 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 a sort of a lot of medical um, writing and production on the age of puberty of Indian women and how uh, both environment and race feature in um, leading to this sort of conclusions about the sexual maturation of Indian women. Uh, and also not just Indian women, but Indian women in certain parts of uh, in the East, as opposed to in other parts of the country and so on, um, which is um, which is uh, very much part of the story that I discuss in the first chapter of my book. Uh, 